Hello, my name is Sonal Batra and I am an emergency medicine physician as well as the principal investigator of the Social Mission Metrics Initiative at the Fitzhugh Mellon Institute for Health Workforce Equity. This is our 11th webinar session in the Mullen Institute mini-series on emergency health workforce policies to address COVID-19. Today, we're gonna to be exploring how schools and academic medical centers responses to the COVID-19 pandemic have been impacted and are enhanced by their social mission. Social mission is a term that's been brought into popularity by the late Dr. Fitzhugh Mullen, and it's been defined by the Beyond Flexner Alliance as such. It's the contribution of the school and its mission, program, and the performance of its graduates, faculty, and leadership in advancing health equity and addressing the health disparities of the society in which it exists. The social mission includes the school's programs that advance diversity and inclusion, community engagement, and addressing social determinants of health. It also emphasizes the role of healthcare providers within the health system, including as advocates and as public health practitioners. Many schools use a social mission concept to define their educational and institutional commitments to health equity. In previous work by the Mullen Institute, we've been measuring social mission in 18 activity areas, ranging from curriculum to research. Today, we're gonna to be focusing in on a few of these activity areas, particularly curriculum, student activism, and community engagement. Increasingly, discussion about the pandemic has been highlighting severe health inequities in the United States. For example, more men are dying from the coronavirus than women, and the disease has targeted those with pre-existing medical conditions, disproportionately affecting communities of color, uh, especially because they're more likely to suffer hypertension, heart disease, asthma, and diabetes than white Americans. It also highlights the need for systems level change to educate and mobilize a health workforce prepared to respond to a global crisis like COVID-19. In today's session, our speakers will describe how schools are working to collaboratively improve the health of vulnerable communities today, as well as preparing their students to ensure um, a future health workforce that's better equipped to handle crises like the ones we find ourselves in now. I'd like to introduce our three panelists. First, we have Dr. Bob Deaton, who is a Senior Associate Dean of Clinical Public Health, as well as the Murdoch Held Professor of Medicine and Health Policy in the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Prior to his work at GW, Dr. Deaton has held national leadership positions, including within the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the National Institutes of Health, and in the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. David Edelman is a student co-chair of the COVID-19 Student Service Corps at Columbia, Columbia University Bagalos College of Physicians and Surgeons. He's a recent early graduate of the medical school and will additionally earn a Master of Public Health from Columbia University um, Mailman School of Public Health in May. And Dr. Veronica Mallet is Executive Director of the Center for Women's Health Research at Meharry Medical College. She previously served as the Senior Vice President of Health Affairs and Dean at Meharry Medical College School of Medicine. Prior to her work at Meharry, she had leadership positions at Northwestern University, Wayne State University, and the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Dr. Mallet is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in reducing health disparities and is a prolific author with nearly 100 articles, books, chapters, and abstracts. So Dr. Deaton, Popper, I'd like to go ahead and start with you. So as you know, social mission is really about how schools are educating and preparing future clinicians to practice in the 21st century. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about the curricular work you're currently doing at GW related to clinical public health and how it relates to social mission as well as the crisis we find ourselves in now? So um, thank you very much for um, putting on this webinar. I think that COVID-19 is truly uh, helping us articulate the importance of social mission of our institutions and the role of disparities um, in, in our nation and seen very vividly right now. Uh, it, the, the context of, of um, social mission and what the role of our clinicians need to be uh, is something that GW has, uh, has recognized for some time now. And with the changing um, healthcare enterprise and 
focus on population health, uh, and, and the realization that um, chronic diseases and, uh, is really driven by health disparities as the leading um, uh, cause of many of our healthcare problems and frankly driving the economy uh, of, of our health systems lately. We believe uh, at GW, and I think a lot of us believe that clinicians really need to take leadership roles outside of the clinic and hospitals to really uh, address those kind of issues. From my perspective, I keep referring to this as this expanded scope of practice um, that uh, clinicians need to have that includes uh, uh, to have abilities um, in population health, in public health, and in, in health system science. Um, um, clinical public health is a concept um, of really the application of principles of public health and population health and health system science um, uh, and leadership uh, in, in healthcare decision making. Uh, we believe that clinicians who practice in the 21st century, really, we all have to have excellent clinical acumen in taking care of individual patients using evidence-based practices. Um, but also we have to understand health policy and have, have expertise in health systems. Um, and, uh, and to ha use our role as clinicians to have impact, um, not just in our health systems, but in our community, um, and uh, to, to be leaders and advocates for improved community health. And we think of this expanded scope of practice really as um, who we focus on. It's beyond just the individual. We also should be focusing on communities and populations. It's where we do our job. Um, it's beyond the exam room and what our role is in, in health systems and in communities. And it's what we do. It's beyond individual um, clinical care to our leadership um, in health systems and, and health systems change. So at GW, um, we have uh, been integrating this into our medicine and other health sciences curriculums for some time now. Um, we, we have a course that now all medical students are required to take for the first two years of medical school called Patients, Populations, and Systems. This is a, a weekly course where uh, students have lectures and panel discussions. They have cases and small group case-based discussions um, in this course. We've also integrated into our, our clinical sciences and reasoning course, um, a public health objectives uh, as students are learning their organ systems and, and their, how to you know, uh, diagnose uh, and take care of patients. We also have these things that we call clinical public health summits that I'll talk about in just a moment and a clinical public health mentor program uh, again, I'll talk about it in a moment. Our goal at GW is to prepare GW students to become what we call clinician citizens with that expanded scope of practice that I talked about a moment ago. Let me um, really wrap up this part um, uh, of the discussion with um, g giving you a little bit of detail about the, um, the course Patients, Populations, and Systems. Again, it's re a required course of all of our medical students. And the goal for the student is to integrate their basic science learning clinical care with population health, public health, health policy, and health systems practice. Well, in this two-year course, we, of course, present a wide range of topics, um, you know, everything from health system organization, um, healthcare financing and economics, health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, ACA, et cetera, but also dive into uh, what we think of as the social mission that we all have uh, practicing medicine around disparity, social determinants of health, health policy, uh, 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 evidence-based practice, disparities, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think I'll stop right now, um, uh, but just to, with the conclusion that at GW, we, we've uh, really integrated a lot of, of, of new content into uh, how we teach uh, clinicians. Uh, that really does relate to this concept of social mission and giving our students um, the, the knowledge, the skills, and frankly, the attitudes to uh, practice that expanded scope of practice um, beyond just taking care of individual patients, but what their responsibility is in their health systems, in their communities, in their states, in the nation um, to, um, to address um, this uh, social mission. So I'll, uh, that's, uh, the, the, the slides have more introduction that if people want to dive into it, but um, that's how I'll start. Thank you, Bopper. Just a, a follow-up question for you, Bopper. Can you tell us a little bit more about how some of the principles of clin clinical public health that you mentioned 
um, that are really being now taught to every medical student um, through this course are being deployed during the COVID-19 pandemic, whether that's from the student level, the faculty level, or the institutional perspective. Yeah, um, so a lot is going on um, uh, related to COVID-19. I mean, I think many of us who deal in medical education know medical students are usually quite energized and very proactive and committed. And so as COVID-19 has evolved, uh, students at GW and our faculty all have really begun to um, uh, uh, do a, a lot of, of activities, educational and volunteer activities as well. Obviously built on that foundation that I just talked about, there's a lot of, 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 of pre-existing knowledge and experience among our faculty uh, and among our students um, uh, that have prepared them to respond to COVID-19. Um, from an education um, perspective, we've created COVID-19 learning labs um, where we're uh, having every other week sessions um, a focus uh, for students and for faculty on what is the latest, um, what are the latest issues and knowledge about COVID-19. Um, our first learning lab gave basics, but also really did get into a lot of the, the legal uh, and the social and the disparities aspect. Our next learning lab is actually going to be totally focused on um, vulnerable populations in COVID-19 and um, the very disturbing data that I think we're all seeing about the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on uh, uh, people who, um, who, uh, who have health disparities. Also, we've created an elective for our medical students specifically focused on COVID-19, a 10 um, session uh, elective on various aspects. Uh, we're also integrating COVID-19 related uh, topics into our patients populations and systems course, um, and uh, as well as doing a, 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 an education program for all of the providers um, uh, in the GW healthcare system, the hospital and our medical faculty practice and our faculty, um, where we, um, the, the um, clinical public health faculty are serving as the, what we think of as the intelligence unit for the clinical response that's going on in our institutions, where we are um, uh, teeing up and filtering um, uh, really useful and concise information uh, for our frontline providers about the public health and population health aspects of COVID-19. Our students particularly have really been mobilized um, and have done some really tremendous volunteer work um, uh, around uh, testing uh, uh, and uh, uh, finding and securing personal protective equipment for our, our, um, our, 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 our frontline health personnel. Also, um, it created a DC metro area resource guide around COVID-19. Um, they've created a child care program for frontline providers and for hospital workers and cafeteria workers and maintenance engineers who have children who need to be cared for now that a lot of daycares are closed. We have medical students who are going and doing babysitting for uh, personnel who are working. So there's a whole lot of, of, of activities going on around our campus to support um, uh, our responses to COVID-19 in the DC metro area. Thank you, Bopper. That's a good segue. As you mentioned, uh, students across the country, across the world have been really energized. And I think it's, um, we have the wonderful opportunity to hear from a learner's perspective as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, move over to David. Um, you've had firsthand experience with this, of course, in being in the New York City area, which is a hot spot of coronavirus cases and deaths. Um, what were your concerns when this pandemic started as a student? And can you tell us what you did to resolve those concerns? Sure. And uh, just thank you, Sonal, for, for having me as part of this panel and, and to hear about clinical public health from, from Bopper. I think this is like really applicable to what we're doing um, and such a great framework to think through um, how students can respond and how we can build uh, systems in the future to ensure education of students in this clinical public health realm. Um, the, there were sort of two things that happened to me uh, when, when coronavirus started in New York City. Um, first, it was on a personal level. One of the first things that happened uh, curricularly was our student-run free clinics were closed due to infection risk and exposure. Uh, for example, the one that I work at is actually in the basement of a church. Um, and when that happened, there was a lot of anxiety among students about how are we going to care for our patients? Um, this was really our first foray into clinical care. Um, and we had developed very strong relationships with these patients, seeing them every week, 
um, in a setting in which um, care would be accessible to people who don't normally access care in uh, traditional clinical settings, um, people with, with and without insurance, um, language barriers. And so it was a very scary time for students, um, especially as learners who were entering the clinical sphere to be taken out of that. Uh, and so uh, a fellow student and I saw a lot of this, um, this, this tension and, and these emotions and thought, you know, with all of our energized students, um, perhaps there was a way we could organize all of the students together uh, to productively work towards caring, continuing to care for our patients. Um, so we worked to create this student-run free clinic task force pretty early on um, in March uh, and got an overwhelming response from all the students. Um, that ended up actually taking a back burner because the, the epidemic continued to grow in New York City and classes became canceled and eventually students were pulled from clinical rotations. And so essentially what happened was our experience of building this task force proposal um, gave us the background for understanding how could we engage students in this response. Um, and so the day that students were pulled from clinical rotations, we engaged in a number of discussions with some really motivated um, and terrific faculty mentors uh, and started to develop what eventually became the COVID-19 Student Service Corps. The idea of the Service Corps was to be able to provide an avenue for students to engage in the response to COVID um, and do so safely and remotely using their skills, their passion, energy, and empathy. And our mission was to support the health system uh, in a number of different ways, whether it's the healthcare system itself in terms of physical structures like hospitals, um, the patients of the system, the workforce, staff and students, and also our general communities using an interprofessional approach and a service learning lens. And we, we developed this toolkit, which you see here, as a way to help other places to also build a structure that we thought um, would work pretty well and has actually worked fairly well. A layered leadership structure that responds to those needs of the health system and in the community um, that allows for projects to be developed in ways that, pro that student and faculty co-leadership would help drive these projects forward um, and allow for student engagement in service. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see that uh, this is sort of our, our, orga our collapsed organizational chart, just an overview of how we've developed these programs over time um, and where they, they fit. So patient and system facing projects, so staff and student facing projects, and a, a growing community connections in which these are community based projects to respond to those specific community needs, leveraging uh, pre existing uh, relationships with community based organizations. Um, all of these projects are remote. Uh, they allow for student engagement across many different schools throughout Columbia. Um, if at the outset uh, or over the last few weeks, um, we've had up to 1,600 students who have expressed interest in volunteering at some point, um, many of whom are, are actively engaged in projects, uh, these including some that have been more recently developed. And you can see on the next slide that um, this is almost a, a heat map in a way of every project. Um, showing the interdisciplinary involvement. Um, the, the red and orange colors are a little bit more of the clinical side, and so while a few of our projects are more clinically oriented, the majority of the projects are actually non-clinical. Um, and they work to leverage that interprofessional collaboration to allow for um, a lot of engagement within the, the full healthcare system, um, not simply from the, the medical student perspective or, or from the medical school perspective, but we have student leaders from the nursing school, occupational therapy, physical therapy, the school of public health, the school of dental medicine, um, and really uh, using that um, to engage in service in a way that helps people think beyond their traditional setting. Thank you, David. So just to follow up on that, so how have you kept social mission at the forefront of your work when responding to a crisis like COVID? You've already addressed some of that, that question and looking at your focus on what the community and the health system needs are, but perhaps you can uh, expand and reflect on that a bit more. Absolutely. So social mission is really a, a key component of what we do to engage in um, our service learning activities. And it's because of, we use that service learning lens as such a key component of what we do. Um, so this is a, a, you know, a social ecological model showing uh, how students relate to the larger health system and also where reflection falls into that. Um, and uh, the idea of service learning for us um, is to allow for that preparation and engagement and also to create a formalized and standardized way in which students can reflect upon their experience in a time where they're really not participating in the ways they anticipated when entering their, their graduate schooling. Um, and so we, we started these reflections uh, last week um, with a written reflection. This week we had a, a, a facilitated Zoom reflection. Um, and uh, I think that this, this model really shows how the reflection plays into 
um, what students are doing on an individual level and what's really happening on the system level. And you see that the student sort of lies within the project um, and the reflection happens uh, on almost an inter-project level. So we mix together students from different projects, but within their, their bucket, as we called it, on the organizational chart. So students on the patient, um, on some sort of patient-facing project, maybe on one project and another project, but they really talk together about how their experiences have impacted them in their professional development, have shown them about social determinants of health or taught them something new about health systems. And really this falls within our greater uh, service core within all of the interdisciplinary schools and ultimately um, among the communities that we engage with. And um, on the next slide is just the example of the prompt that we had uh, for our first discussion post. So we had students um, respond on our uh, internal server on a discussion board that involved other students as well. Um, how are you responding to the pandemic so far in terms of what you feel you can and cannot control? Um, and, and I've seen firsthand, I, I joined one of the discussion groups last night, the facilitated ones, about the power in which this reflection is allowing students to really um, grapple with being pulled from their normal responsibilities and also um, learn from this experience um, and learn from uh, this different type of engagement and how it impacts um, their, their future career. Um, and to give an example of this, uh, I, there was a student who, who recently was expressing some frustration on one of the projects. This project is onboarding patients onto telemedicine, um, which is a really important uh, project to really offload some of the strain on the healthcare system, particularly among uh, patients who are not hospitalized, keeping them out of clinical spaces, the emergency department, and the hospital, and allowing them to access care. Um, and the frustration was around the fact that it was really difficult to get these patients onto the platform. They needed to have active email addresses, internet, smartphones. Um, and talking through with the student about how that frustration is really related to the idea of social determinants of health and really some of the structural barriers that many of our patients face and how that even engaging some of these patients who may not be able to access it, but also engaging others who can get on allows more time for us to focus on those patients who, who have those structural determinants um, and focus on ways to alleviate that and create more facilitated um, formats for patients to be involved in care during this really difficult time for, for everyone. Thank you, David. That's really amazing to hear how much you've been able to set up and, and kind of the thought that you and your team have put into this um, to bring it forward in, in a really engaging and well thought out and structured level. I'm sure you're continuing to learn as you go along, but it sounds like um, it's been a, a pretty impressive effort so far. Um, so you talked quite a bit about um, the engagement with the community and it's really great to see those types of projects where you've been able to leverage pre-existing relationships. Um, and I want to take that over to Dr. Mallet. Dr. Mallet, um, Meharry Medical College has had a, a long history of a strong relationship within its community and the community that's served by the medical institutions there. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that, specifically about Meharry's role within its community and how that's impacted um, the institution's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, thank you so much, Sono, for um, inquiring about that. And I did want to comment on the excellent work that our, uh, my fellow panelists are doing at their institutions. Meharry is uh, centered in the heart of North Nashville, which it, uh, traditionally has been uh, a, an area where a, a high concentration of African-American patients uh, lived. It is undergoing some gentrification at this time, but uh, it's, it continues to be predominantly African American. And one startling statistic of the zip code 37208 is that it has the highest incarceration rate in the nation. Um, I don't know how that uh, statistic came to be, but it is uh, one a startling fact that, that the population that we serve it deals with. Um, and Meharry's response to, to COVID, we do have the benefit of having as our president, Dr. James um, Hildreth, who is an infectious disease specialist and virologist. And fortunately for the city of Nashville, he has been in partnership with the um, Mayor uh, John Cooper 
and has been part of the daily briefings for the city. And so it has uh, structured the mayor's response in such a way that it is very much based on listening to the public health experts and on uh, science and less on the political and emotional response that we can see in some other areas of the country. And I want to take our listeners back to the timing of the uh, virus outbreak in Tennessee. On the, the Tuesday before the first case was report, reported was the tornado in Nashville. And that um, very much affected our community in 37208. And we mobilized a campus-wide response to um, help the community. And in Nashville, there was an outpouring of community engagement to help tornado victims. Um, so that March 7th was um, the, the uh, really first um, Meharry-wide drive to help the tornado victims. Cases had been reported in Williamson County and then that very next week was when cases were reported in Davidson County. And shortly after that, um, the shelter in place order came to, um, to Nashville. And Nashville is very much a service oriented uh, city. And so many of the workers who are working in that tourist and service industry are now displaced and out of work. And it is not a state that expanded Medicaid. So um, with that loss of employment comes loss of health care. And as you know, there has been no uh, national response to how uh, uh, people are to um, address this uh, economic peril they're finding themselves in without health insurance and the need to continue to seek care. At Meharry, we continue to provide care uh, and we have to date provided about $35 million of uncompensated care on an annual basis. And we know that we will uh, maximize that in this setting as more and more people are seeking care who don't have insurance through telehealth. And um, that is obviously very challenging as the two other speakers alluded to, if you don't have a smartphone and you don't have the technology. So we remain open uh, on an ambulatory basis for those patients because that represents a significant portion of our patient population. Um, the other significant response is the partnership that we have with the city to do community assessment. And so uh, we launched in the, the beginning of April um, community testing, and uh, it is both drive-through and walk-up. And there are three sites that are sponsored by the city, but our site on the Meharry campus is the only one that allows walk-up. And you have to really think about the health disparity that is set in place if you must be in a car in order to get tested. If you don't have a car and you don't know an individual with a car, then how are you going to get tested? And the other two sites have, uh, who are um, staffed by uh, the other hospital systems, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Ascension Health and HCA, um, felt uncomfortable taking care of walk-ups from a liability point of view, but this indeed creates an additional disparity because we get a significant number of walk-ups in our community assessment every day. People who are on the bus or actually walking to get tested. And at least on two occasions while I was staffing at the assessment center, the individuals were too short of breath to uh, walk back and we called the EMT to get them to the hospital. And so um, I think that 
as a nation, we need to address how testing is done, where it's done, and who we are uh, allowing to uh, get tests in order to um, maximize those individuals who are able to uh, obtain those tests. <laughs> we are also participating with the uh, Tennessee Department of Health on messaging to um, communities uh, around the, the state, both urban and rural, African-American and Latinx communities. And in, with the idea that we have to tailor that messaging to the population and where the population might be getting their information from and engage in on the ground soldier outreach. And so um, our, our uh, <coughs> personnel, I'm on that task force as is our community outreach team to help to structure that uh, messaging. Um, you might be aware that Dr. Hildreth has been um, helping actually the nation to understand the impact of the virus. And from a research point of view, we do have uh, one of our investigators that is close to launching a drug trial that would interrupt where the virus is uh, 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 attacking in, in the cell in the hopes of uh, arresting the destructive effect that, that uh, COVID-19 is having throughout many of the organ systems that, that we're aware of. So that's just some of the responses that Meharry is engaged in. Thank you, Veronica. I think that, that clearly highlights um, some of the most basic um, causes for health disparities that we're seeing in this pandemic. So I'd like to, to open it up to really any of the panelists to perhaps comment in on, based on your experiences during this pandemic and prior to this pandemic as educators and as students, what do you think that health professions, schools, medical schools, and others should be doing to be better prepared for future crises like the ones we're finding ourselves in now, particularly um, to combat the striking health disparities that we're seeing as a result of this? Uh, this is Bopper, let me start. I, I just think we have to take advantage of the, this, um, the horrible situation that we find ourselves in and not shy away from, um, from calling it what it is. And that is, it is a, a pandemic that in this country is so disproportionately affecting uh, those who are underserved and those who live with health disparities that um, the, the quicker we get data, the quicker that we get that data out and really call the question. We as health professionals, we who, people who wear white coats have to call it what it is. Um, it, you know, it, its roots are in, um, in really the, the, the social um, uh, fabric of, of this country um, that let's call it what it is. You know, it's, it's, it's racism, it's, it's institutionalized, uh, you know, from top to bottom, and, uh, and, and it's how our system is set up. We uh, who wear the white coat, you know, I think we have to um, call it and also not just call it, but respond to it and, and be the role models for, um, for both the clinicians that we're training today, but also for uh, for our communities, for our health systems, uh, and, and, and I think that we have the solutions. We have to start uh, uh, talking about them and, uh, and, and just be honest. You know, Dr. Fauci is being honest. Every day he stands up there at that podium uh, as a clinician, as a scientist, and I think the science is there. The, the epidemiology is there. Let's call it. Uh, the solutions are not going to be easy, but I think we have to teach that from day one of medical school and PA school and nursing school. And, uh, and uh, I think that our, our young uh, providers uh, who are in education now are ready to take up the mantle. And uh, as David is showing us, you know, uh, that, that's what we want to promote uh, as, as um, the current and the future healthcare of this country. And, and if I could also echo what, what Bopper is saying, I, the, the legacy of the history of the founding of this country is 
come to light more profoundly in this crisis than, than I, certainly in my lifetime probably not in my parents' lifetime as my father uh, grew up in the segregated South, but, but uh, certainly in, in, in my lifetime, you can really point back to the formation and foundation of our country. So we as, as healthcare providers need to ensure that several things. First, that as emergent therapies and, and um, investigations into vaccines are coming forth, that those uh, in our communities are enrolled in those clinical trials. And for that to happen, it's going to take trusted community voices in order to uh, ensure that that community engagement happens to get people to participate because there's a lot of mistrust as these disparities have come to light that this is that, they're, that black lives don't matter. And so uh, it's that mistrust can uh, really be uh, detrimental to uh, having our population enrolled in clinical trials to know uh, whether it could benefit in, in patients with the multiple comorbidities that we're seeing uh, are in line with the people who are dying. The second thing is what I was alluding to before, and that is testing. We have to be testing where our people are. They are not having the luxury of social distancing. Many of them are in the frontline workforce. And so we need to partner with their employers to do testing on site in the grocery stores, in the meat packing plants, in um, they're also the ones that are coming into our houses to clean them and we need to provide the opportunity. They're in the hospital, cleaning the hospital. So we need to uh, be doing the testing of the workforce where our people are and facilitate it in a way that is equitable. So like I was alluding to, don't make it mandatory to have a car when everybody doesn't have one. And then the next thing, it, uh, Bopper allowed it to, to the data, but, but we also have to have the messaging be broad enough to be inclusive of all our disenfranchised and marginalized communities. And here in Nashville, that means the African-American, Latinx, and uh, the, uh, the um, Kurdish community. We have a large Kurdish community Many of them are Arabic only speaking. And, um, and so we need to know locally what that community is and how to get that messaging from those trusted leaders as to where that testing is and where the care is. And then the last thing is we need to expand Medicaid across the US and we as health providers have to really advocate for this as a life or death thing to do. Um, it's difficult in states like mine to take that position because our governor is very much against it and we are in partnership with the state um, on a number of things and politically it is challenging. But if we do it collectively as with for all um, 154 MD schools and all the osteopathic schools, and we lead our, our collective voice and all of the um, expansive healthcare providers in terms of the nurse practitioners and PAs and public health professionals, then potentially we can um, provide ourselves the cover and the power to make our voice heard. Thank you. I think those highlight both problems and, and solutions, both in the short term and, and some that are very uh, longer term and that are going to take um, a lot of effort from our rising healthcare workforce. I'd, I'd like to turn it back to David for a minute to perhaps close out and maybe you can reflect on, you know, now that you have um, become a newly minted physician and are joining the healthcare workforce and, and have created an organization to 
um, bring others along on the service learning journey with you. What things that you think um, medical schools or health professional schools should be doing um, in order to achieve some of the goals that were just highlighted? Yeah, I, I actually was was debating jumping in before you before you asked that question, and I think I was going to address a similar point because I, I think um, what what Veronica and Bopper said so is so clear about the root of the issues and what needs to change. And um, I think that COVID has highlighted, um, as we've heard in Northern Nashville, and also as is seen a lot, I think, in the popular press in New York City, out in Elmhurst in Queens, is how disparities are really at the root of so many of these issues. And what I've come to learn is that there is so much to be covered in medical school. But um, for me, as someone interested in that clinical public health, as Buffer described, much of what I learned about um, being able to address these really fundamental disparities rooted in structural and institutional racism and um, rooted in all of these uh, different policies that don't capture a lot of people in, um, in testing procedures, in um, in, in social distancing policies that don't account for who those people are that are in, that are unable to engage in that. Um, I, I found that it's the public health education that really brought that into the forefront. And I think that you know, one of the things that, that we've done in the service corps is really had a focus on that interprofessional collaboration. And I really do think that health profession education needs to be just that health profession education. Um, and, and to really try and break down those silos between all the different health professional schools that have evolved over time because they did represent very different jobs and there are still so many different things that are done. But I think all of us are now becoming as we enter into these professions, health professionals and. And I think that to be able to engage in that and, we have to have an understanding of what all those other people do and then grasp on to that other part that we can bring with us as clinicians. Clinicians and educators, clinicians and public health practitioners, clinicians and you know whatever else that and will be um, and really holistically um, engage the learner in that process um, and teach them ways that they can improve more than the individual patient care. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think I'm going to be certainly reflecting on all of your comments um, in the days and the weeks and the months to come as we continue to think about how um, we can overcome this pandemic as well as create longer lasting change in our health system that hopefully will make it a, a more equitable country and world um, in the time to come. So I just want to thank you again, all three of you for joining this panel and for sharing your experiences um, and your thoughts about the COVID-19 pandemic as it relates to social mission and your institutions. I hope everyone has an excellent rest of the day and stay safe.